This video was sponsored by Squarespace. What if real life were just a little more convenient? What if I could drive my dream car in the most beautiful parts of the world at 300 miles per hour and end up on TikTok instead of Live League? The answer to that question is Forza Horizon, an arcade racer that seeks not to do away with reality, but instead to idealize it. And what an idealization playground have created. 540 cars in tantalizing fidelity, freedom and physics refined for a decade that simulate the act of driving in meticulous detail and yet make it impossibly effortless to feel like a badass. In a driving game, that is the most important thing, so how could I possibly hope to convince you this game is bad? I couldn't. I wouldn't. This isn't a negative review of Forza Horizon 5. It's a review about the negatives, because that's what Horizon needs. You could watch a review of Forza Horizon 2 to understand why Forza Horizon 5 is a good game. But Horizon doesn't need another 10 out of 10, or another claim that it is the greatest arcade racer of all time. Horizon needs a spotlight shone on the mistakes it continues to make, that it has started to make, and that continue to keep it from that potential. Good? Yes. Greatest? No. That's not a title befitting of a racer that still hasn't got the racing right. Are you ready? Let's start with what you need to know about difficulty. The AI in first place is very, very fast and very, very good at avoiding mistakes. Catching up to it tends to be as tough or tougher than taking every other position. Half the time you're struggling with a race, this is the reason why. When you're in first place, however, everything changes. It's easy to keep your lead in Horizon. It's actually easy even to widen it, which gives me the impression that previous leaders are debuffed once you've passed them. So, when you don't have first, it's hard to get it. But when you've got it, it's easy to keep it. This is Forza Horizon 5's first place difficulty disparity, and it is big enough to influence the fucking tides. The worst of its effects is the degradation of racing itself. The excitement of a close-fought battle where every position is relevant can exist, but rarely does. More often, only one position is relevant. Or if taken, none of them are. Being in first place is nice, but it isn't interesting. The race becomes tantamount to a time trial. A further effect of first place disparity is that knowing how important it can be to catch the leader puts immense emphasis on the first few turns and the first 60 seconds of the race, because that's when the gaps between places are closest. It can seem to be that your performance in these moments is so disproportionately influential over the final outcome that your performance afterwards feels deflatingly unimpactful. What's worse is that by placing such emphasis on those first corners, Horizon equally emphasizes the worst tactics possible for taking positions on corners. Crashing. Thanks to how the physics dulls the impact of vehicle collisions and the absence of penalties, a well-executed slam will always outperform a smoothly taken corner. There's the added bonus of obliterating your victim, too. Skimming checkpoints is something a Horizon driver would believably do, but but abusing the physics like this comes at the cost of damaging Horizon's fantasy. Now, the simpler solution to catching first would surely be to bring a better car. Well, yeah, of course. But first, you'll need to know what a better car is. You see, in Horizon, you can bring any car to any event, and the AI will balance themselves accordingly. A little leeway on that is to be expected. If the balance was perfect, then there'd be no such thing as good cars or bad cars. But there is such a thing as good and bad, which means the consistency of Horizon 5's difficulty rests on being able to tell which will be good and which will be bad. Which is a problem, because for the average player, no such ability exists. Without a PhD in Horizon's metagame, the balancing is unpredictable. There are simply too many cars for you and the AI to choose from. Too many ways each of them can be upgraded and fine-tuned. The competence of the balancing is itself questionable, and the performance index number meant to present a simple summation of a car's strength to the player is so unreliable that you'd be better off reading their fucking horoscope. The stock Senna sucked. The upgraded Senna was great. The stock CZ GT was also great, but the upgrade made it suck. The result is the feeling that difficulty is a dice roll. Too often in Horizon 5 will you enter an event and be surprised that your car has made it far too easy or far too hard. And because odds of success shift so dramatically based on the specific challenge of taking the lead, even a small difference that provides a push towards doing so can still amount to a large change in experience difficulty. And because rolling the dice again with a different car might change things in your favor, it's all the more frustrating that it can't be done between attempts of an event. Instead, you have to quit the event and haul your ass back over to its start point to pick again. Unfortunately, our problems don't end there. Like the dissatisfaction of a story breaking its internal rules, the sense of competition and the fantasy of the race is ruined when the AI operates outside the bounds of Horizon's pre-established physics. Things like the occasional privilege of enemies wading through water, similar entry, similar clearance, but they pass through it like it's not even there. And the blatant privilege of enemies on the highest difficulties to turn with so much downforce they could break the Earth's crust. But there are also some things that give you an unfair advantage, like the racing line, which frequently appears to be smoking crack. According 
According to conventional wisdom, the red zones indicate a need to bleed some of your speed in order to make an upcoming turn without flying off. But in Horizon, that's not always the case. Sometimes you can easily take the racing line's red zones flat out with nary a consequence. It's just obvious that the best thing to do is not to slow down. This bizarre phenomena isn't so much a problem for you as it is for the AI drivers who like to do exactly what the line tells them to do. When they see such a false red zone, they'll break, and you won't. And you'll make up a second or two, or maybe you'll soar past. It's a big win, but it won't be very pleasing because you did nothing to earn it. It feels, again, like abuse. Since some tracks have a lot of these false braking zones but others don't, Horizon's inconsistent difficulty is once again exacerbated. Now, to go any further with this analysis, we first need to reaffirm our perspective on what Forza Horizon is. A hardcore racer. That is, compared to every other arcade racer. It's a sim next to Need for Speed and Burnout, because to be convincing is Horizon's fantasy. Real life? Idealized. But in order to make that work whilst appealing to the broadest audience, Horizon needs a way to erase the severe consequence of error that comes with semi-realistic driving. The fantasy fails if every crash on tracks you've never seen before costs you the entire race. And so we must rely upon the Rewind system, Horizon's necessary evil. And let's not downplay the evil. Rewinds involve literally breaking the flow of the race apart, butchering the fantasy in doing so to pull you back through time. Their game design chemotherapy, they never leave the host unharmed. But with one or two a race, they're tolerable. Until something changes. Something that would raise the number of rewinds to the point of greater frustration. Something like cross country, which is also tolerable, usually. The thing about cross country is the tracks have a lot of bumps, which means a lot of airtime, even in tiny amounts. And airtime magnifies minor distortions in your car's momentum into much bigger problems. It can be quite sudden, and quite fun when the event is easy. It's a little more frustrating when it's hard. But it's only a serious problem when you get to the parts of the track that seem especially designed to cause it. On a macrocosmic scale, the jumps. Any rogue momentum, once containable, now has the airtime to become a death spiral. If you're rotating at all, you've got to rewind. Sometimes you've got to rewind half a dozen times because rogue momentum can be very hard to kill. And you might have to kill all of it when the checkpoint you're aiming for is particularly tight. It's especially irritating when said checkpoint is obscured from view by the ramp itself, which means you'll need to fail the jump and rewind just to get a look at where you're going. Hills, the purest expression of Horizon's carefree fantasy, become the knee over which it is snapped. Checkpoints should have been consistently visible, consistently wider, or run-ups should have been straighter so as to let you dissipate unwanted momentum. Cross-country, sometimes fun, sometimes agony. Which brings me on to the second thing that makes rewinds unfortunately frequent. Difficulty. As difficulty rises, so does the weight of your mistakes, and so does the incentive to erase them. Rewinds become a further incentive in themselves to make the riskiest moves, because you know you can reverse your failures. Pressure to make the most of track limits increases, but because track limits in Horizon are defined by checkpoints, the punishment for exceeding them is once again a rewind. Rewinds are the product of difficulty in Horizon. And even though that sucks, it's not easy to call it a criticism, because it seems so fundamental. Rewinds were always the price we would have to pay for an accessible power fantasy with semi-realistic driving, right? Well, after all that talk of leader disparity and inconsistencies, I realize it might not entirely be so fundamental. For one, the incentives are highest to make the riskiest moves most likely to end with a rewind when your car feels hopelessly outmatched. And there's nothing fundamental about Horizon's inconsistent difficulty. Address the balance, and you reduce the problem. Make it not annoying to switch cars, and that'd help too. For another, you know what else promotes the riskiest moves? Knowing that your greatest advantages will come from not breaking when the line says you should. Playground could not have come up with a better way to discourage caution. Fix this, and you'd hit the problem again. And there's one more thing. We know that rewinds are a product of difficulty, but have we ever questioned what we're actually trying to achieve? Winning? Define winning, because Horizon defines winning very specifically. Winning in Horizon means coming first. Anything less can feel a lot like losing. It actually is losing in Hot Wheels Park, where second or lower is the same as a DNF. In Mexico, the loss is more psychological. It's more so that you don't feel comfortable finishing in a lower position. As a start, take a look at the map. If you come first, the event is gilded, a visible mark of accomplishment. If you finish beneath first, there is no bronze or silver gilding. It is only even acknowledged by the worthless and intangible accolade points. Then take a look at the end Screen. In Horizon 5, the first place driver alone is labeled the winner, as their invariably embarrassing emote functions as a taunt. Afterwards, you're told how much XP you earned, but not how many credits, which is the vastly more tangible reward. Neither is there a rising gauge that displays clear progress towards unlocking more events. Both things that in Horizon 4 helped encourage a greater comfort with lower placements. And as a finishing touch, if you come lower than first multiple times in a row, you will be asked whether you'd like to lower the difficulty. The message that sends is clear. It's first 
or fuck you. This is also not an easy point to make, because Horizon has always been frustratingly hesitant to reward good performance. But that's not what's happening here. The game recognises no meaningful difference between a second and twelfth place finish. This is about the very conscious effort Horizon has made to promote first as the sole definition of success, and the problems that has caused. Because races, sometimes, can feel like they're not even worth finishing if you place any lower, which creates an especially intense pressure to change that with rewinds. You see? Not quite so fundamental. But there's more. This is also what gives such unique relevance to leader disparity, and the difficulty inconsistencies that are magnified by it. It even creates an unfavourable pressure to play an event repeatedly until you come first, instead of moving on to new events, comfortable with pole, and coming back later for a higher position, which might have done the game's variation some good. The racing experience of Horizon 5 can be so mediocre, the mechanics of it all so generally clumsy, that you start to think, damn, you're lucky you're so pretty, Horizon. If it weren't for that onslaught of spectacle and fidelity and music, and the feel of the cars, would I still enjoy racing them? Or would I be back on Need for Speed Heat already? And it's not the only time you'll get that impression. I want to talk about Horizon's other events. Not the franchises, but everything on offer that doesn't fit into those four categories. Like the Expeditions. Curated Horizon. The right car, the right music, and the right weather is selected to complement and harmonise with the right location. The Volcano, Tremors, an RS-200, Gustav Holtz, Mars, and a buggy thingamajig for the getaway, right into a dirt race. The Ruins, Lightning, Wind, and Adrenaline pumping through the sound. God, Horizon and Curated Harmony is still bliss, and it can make an event with mechanical ideas no better than slowly driving through fucking rocks among the best experiences I've had gaming in quite a long time. But Horizon doesn't always look its best, and sometimes only its best would have been enough to save it from its mechanical lacking. About a minute into the Festival of the Moon event with all the lights and colours and sounds, and having been reminded for the seventeenth time about how excited I should be, it actually came as a surprise when I realised I wasn't. The Porsche was slow and the route was shallow, and the flotilla was slow and the route was even shallower. The smoke and mirrors just aren't always enough to cover for the emptiness inside. And I'm gonna hate having to do this, but to some degree, I felt that way about the showcases too. Oh god, this sucks. Everybody, everybody loves Horizon's showcases. They're the coolest rides. You get to raise fucking F-22s, Optimus Prime, and the Albanian Rosas. What's not to like? Well, you're about to find out. The race of the showcase, though technically real in the sense that you can fail, is otherwise illusory in the sense that the speed and position of your opponent is scripted to provide the tensest racing experience. They've usually got the route advantage, you're usually faster side by side, you'll always be left behind before finding a way to recover the pace, and it'll always be made to seem hopeless, so it's all the more impactful when they conveniently lose half their speed and you shoot past for a split second win. Maybe you believed this was all legit. Ten fucking years ago, it is ten years hence. And what's consistent across showcases number 27 to 30 is that there is no attempt whatsoever to obfuscate the formula or to in any way break its predictability. They're not getting inventive with the routes or the pace with which you trade positions. It's the exact same trick, and the illusion has begun to erode. If I don't believe, even in the slightest, that I can catch up at times like these, and Playground aren't doing anything to change my perspective, I start to mentally check out. The only thing they have changed is making things even more obvious. Never before has your opponents magically losing their speed on the final stretch been quite this extreme, or looked quite this absurd. Challenge is problem two. The mental pressure of knowing that a poor performance could lose you the race can only exist if you believe a mistake is possible, but you're in the stablest cars that exist in the game, driving around shallow corners at manageable speeds. For Horizon's physics, this is a relaxing drive. Showcases have never been so easy, or so lacking in tension. What else do they have to work with? Well, I'm glad you asked that, because as the expeditions have proven, when Horizon looks its best, its mechanical problems can be easily forgotten. That was how Horizon 4 got away with it. You were distracted from its undisguised clockwork by spectacle ramped up beyond anything before. And there's not much critical substance in comparing dicks, but let's face it, Fives is smaller. Four had you race a hovercraft that was bigger than Horizon 1. Fives got this. Four had the Flying Scotsman. Fives got a train. Four had Glen Rannoch. Five's got a uh, not very interesting canyon. Four let you play as motherfucking Mr. Cheese on an ass clenching escape from the Halo ring with Banshees, Pelicans, Carriers, and Cortana, and Five doesn't even have a Breaking Bad crossover. Really, guys? I'm not saying it doesn't have its moments. This was pretty good. And that was. Yep. Okay. Okay, you got me. But that's the exception. The rule is that Horizon 5 lacks the spectacle it needs to cover for everything else it lacks. Repetition has worn down the magic, and I found these showcases bland. Huh. Never expected to use that word. Kinda breaks my heart.
What's left, then, is for us to look at the events contained within Horizon 5's narrative-driven micro-campaigns. You're given a cool car and something very simple to do with it. Sometimes it's hit skill points or drift points or a jump, but usually it's get from point A to point B. There's about 50 in total, and of them I'd say about 50 are mediocre. Okay, maybe 47. When the car and the setting hit just the right notes, you'll enjoy it regardless of what it is. Forging a route through the trees and river, in a buggy, in a hurricane. Yeah, that's cool, but that is not the norm. The norm is Horizon at its most mundane. Three minutes of something not very interesting in a not very interesting place. There is usually more excitement to be had in the drive to the next chapter than in the next chapter. And that's most of the review right there. But there is another problem. What's also normal is some of the strangest balance and objective design I have ever seen in a racer. It all began when I saw a giant destination flare miles in the distance, and an objective that simply read, get to the destination. There was a route on the minimap, but there weren't any checkpoints, so I wondered if you could or if you were supposed to drive to the destination directly. Can you? Yes. Supposed to? I arrived about a minute ahead of the three-star time, so probably not. But then I tried it in the next event, and again, and again. And it turns out, at baffling random, there are some events in every storyline that simply let you cheat. I emphasize baffling because just one event later the same objective might have checkpoints or an out-of-bounds timer that keeps you stuck to the route. But it gets even stranger, because in some events, you need to cheat. If you stick to the route for Alejandra's mountain descent or Rami's buggy in the Baja, you won't even scratch the three-star boundary. They're balanced for the direct path. Then there are the events that let you cheat, that ask you not to cheat, instead of just preventing you from cheating. There's no checkpoints, just the finish line. So keep to the route and get there first. And then there are the events that let you cheat, that tell you to cheat, that aren't balanced for cheating. Under the assumption that ignore Anna in the final test driver race meant ignore Anna, I elected to ignore Anna. And surprisingly enough, I won. By a lot. But Horizon's loony bin balancing is not exclusive to the roots. The difficulty of the three-star boundary is as often forgiving to the point of effortlessness as it is demanding of consistently good play. I've crashed into every wall in Guanajuato and made it with 30 seconds to spare. But there are times even a decent attempt isn't enough. What Horizon wants from you changes with the wind. And given time, it amounted not to frustration, but to complete indifference. I stopped caring about how I performed. And that left these events with very little ground to stand on. They're fine. But they're awful for a game of Horizon's caliber. This is not the greatest arcade racing has been. What I want to talk about next is how all the game's events are distributed. Welcome to the Horizon Adventure, the latest of the franchise's campaign structures, and the latest of their attempts to provide the player with ever more freedom. You'll do some stuff, you'll earn a Horizon Adventure point, and you'll spend it on whatever you'd like to unlock next. If you want, you can do all the showcases first thing. Make your own campaign. Sounds good, right? There'll be no awards for guessing I'm not gonna say yes. First off, holy shit. Why does the game need to be such a nagging Nelly about it? You let loose after an event. You drive off, and then Haley says, It's time to unlock a new adventure! And you'll be forcibly grinded to a halt until you've chosen, and you have to listen to all her dialogue, and it's just the most infuriating thing. Off you go, and into a wall. It happens many times. Why not just have a pop-up, or force me to choose during the post-race credits instead? Or let me skip the dialogue? I don't mean to make a mountain out of a molehill, but this should be tried as a war crime. Now, as for the structure itself, the question on my mind is, how could the benefits of Horizon Adventure possibly outweigh the costs? What we gain is, uh, the novelty of doing things out of order? What we lose is the certainty of intelligent distribution. We lose the designer's understanding of pace and variation, and their ability to create a satisfying shape for the campaign as a whole, with a strong sense of finality and closure. What we lose is meaning. In detaching the ultimate events of each racing franchise from progress or performance in each franchise, they are no longer the boss fights of racing. They are just a long race. In detaching the showcase from progress in Horizon, it becomes a particularly flashy event, instead of something to motivate you forward and punctuate your progress. Why? What's the point? I like freedom, but the Horizon Adventure seems certain to do more harm than good. And it is not alone. It's a point on a much larger trend of effort disconnecting from reward. Let's take a look at another one. Skill score. Yeah. Skill score. This has been flying under the radar for far too long. Now in theory, and I have emailed Bill Nye about this, skill score should reward skill. In reality, skill score rewards stuff. Just stuff. Oh, you'll get skill points for drifting. You'll also get skill points for crashing into trees, and cactuses, and fences. You'll get clean racing bonuses seconds after having snapped someone in half. You'll get show-off bonuses and hard charger bonuses for... 
Uh, to be honest, I'm still not sure. You'll get skill points for airtime, and because the Mexican wilderness is mostly fences, cactuses, and bumps, you'll rack up airtime and destruction bonuses so quickly that nothing else could compete by just driving in a straight line. You see what I mean? Skill score rewards, stuff. Not what's cool for a car to do, or what's difficult for a driver to do. You could blitz a P1 down the highway going for those fat near-miss bonuses, but you'd make points at thrice the rate with none of the risk by driving into trees and sliding through a field. There's no award for taking smooth corners. The points say you should crash. You should spin out because there's bonuses for losing grip and all the fences you flatten. And you know what becomes of this incoherence? Two things. When I'm told to collect skill points by Horizon Arcade, a story objective, or a skill song, it's boredom, because I know the quickest way to do that is to play mindlessly. Otherwise, it's indifference. The UI dances to some incomprehensible tune, and I've long forgotten it's even there. Effort and reward share a complicated relationship in Horizon. Which finally brings me on to credits. Money, with which you buy new cars, new parts, and new ways to make yourself look like an idiot. Now, you will make money through race payouts, and by the time Horizon 6 comes out, you might have enough to buy a Datsun. You're not gonna race for credits. You're gonna spin for credits, which makes it sound like stripping. I mean wheel spins. They're roulette, a matter of chance, like an engram in Destiny. And they're not a bad idea. Who doesn't like a little gamble? The problem is that they're the primary driver of progression. What's consistent is that a lucky few wheel spins will get you more credits than you've earned from every race combined. What's inconsistent is everything else. Maybe you'll play for an hour and come away with a pair of knee-high socks. Not now, Horizon, my wife's watching. Or maybe you'll log on for 10 minutes and land yourself the best car in the game. I don't think effort and reward are ever coming back from this one. And the result of their disconnection is a numbness, where the satisfaction of progression should be. Something similar to indifference. When I win big, I never feel like I earned it. And when I lose, I feel like my time's being wasted. Especially when it socks. That shit's bad enough at Christmas. But there is one more problem with progression. The most important, and the one that has divided the community in two. The progression's too quick, so says the hardcore player, who believes Horizon 5 with its S-Class starter cars, free supercars, and abundance of wheel spins is generous to the point of stamping out the last embers of meaningful progression. Too much value is given and not earned. But then casual Colin collapses through the door, tie loose, breakfast in hand, clearly late for one of his three jobs, and explains that non-basement dwellers have lives and responsibilities, and can't afford to grind video games five hours a day. That massive roadblocks to the fun of the game are pointless and exclusionary. So who's right? Both. These positions are both valid, but the split fanbase for the sake of their arguments tend to invent a false dichotomy. That a game is either a sandbox or a car PG. That Horizon should be, or always has been, one or the other. But we've played previous Horizons. We know that isn't true. We know that Horizon has always sought the broadest appeal through compromise. And we know, from the absence of complaint until recently, that the franchise had done enough for everyone. Until recently. Until Horizon proved willing to take a mile from meaning if it gave instant gratification an inch. Horizon should not be a grind. God knows there are a hundred other games you could play for that. But for those interested in a modest arc of meaningful progress, the needless extremes of Horizon's generosity, the Senna, the Centenario, the best cars in the game by chance, inexorably and severely damages the psychological motive to go on, and the psychological desire for purpose. The experience can feel flat. Likewise, the alternative to starting in the second highest car class isn't a trio of unbearable shitboxes. It's B-Class, a Ray class a Dodge Charger can fulfill the cool car fantasy and provide a larger overhead for progression at once. Everyone, from hardcore to casual, can get enough from Horizon. But they aren't. And that sucks. It's ironic too, isn't it? Because no doubt, this is a result of Playground's continued efforts to further expand their audience. But there is always a point where everyone becomes no one. I think Horizon is beginning to cross it. And I think you might just agree if you're brave enough, if you've got the guts and the stomach to follow me where sanity goes to die. Do you guys know why Forza Horizon 5 took an extra year to develop? It's because Playground needed some time off after realizing they accidentally wrote a tolerable character. Kira Harrison was a marketer. That's it. She, like everybody else, had one dimension, and hers was to introduce and advertise the game's content to the player. Now that doesn't exactly sound like brilliant character work, but Kira didn't deliver the inorganic, soulless, cringeworthy Horizon dialogue with a manic, infantile enthusiasm that resembled an amphetamine high. There's a driver I've had my eye on around here. Find them. 
beat them in a race and we can sign their driver to up to the festival lineup. Or maybe she was just Irish. I don't know. But that basically made her the Walter White of Horizon's characters by Horizon 3 and 4. One character who wasn't annoying was the best its writing had to offer. That was how low the bar had been set for Horizon 5. And they still managed to limbo beneath it. Horizon 5 comes out swinging, having fired Kira, hired Haley, and found new depths of failure on quite literally every other level. What we need to understand first is that Horizon has strengthened its commitment to a positive tone with every entry since Horizon 1. By now, positivity is permanent, and negativity is extinct. Do you know what that means? It's not the absence of grief or despair. It's the absence of all negativity. The notion of losing. The notion of being scared or stressed. The notion of competition. And this denies Horizon 5 everything. The characters can only express excitement, which makes them completely flat and almost indistinguishable from one another. To maintain Horizon's absolute chill, they can only want things with the lowest of stakes, which makes it impossible to care about whether or not they get it. Alejandra wants to restore her Papa Fernando's beetle, but she never knew Papa Fernando, and she's kind of just doing it for fun. The player wants to become a Hall of Famer, but we're already recognized as a superstar and the single most important driver at the festival. Rami wants you to become a Lucha de Carretera because wouldn't it be cool? Frankie wants you to stunt drive for him on a movie because he's a lazy jack-off and if you don't it'll upset the director. Here's what needs to be loudly emphasized. This was probably written for children. That is not a pass. Kids fiction follows the same basic narrative rules as adult fiction. Spongebob has stakes. Horizon doesn't. Its absolute devotion to joy has denied it the theoretical possibility of not being boring. And I did say this doesn't work on any level. That includes the surface. By the standards of children or the standards of adults, Horizon lacks everything that can make dialogue worthwhile in its own right. It lacks charm, it lacks wit. It's usually too lifeless to even qualify as cringe and its attempts at humor fail nine times out of 10. You're really zoning out the competition there. Yeah. Nothing. These guys superstars are the toughest crowd. Uh, that was definitely something. On some lines, the delivery can be so overcooked that if you were to take it seriously, you could easily receive unintended signals. <laughs> it's really here. <laughs> we found it for you, Papa Fernando. But look at it. What we know is light-hearted passion. Here is made to sound more like a disturbed obsession. It's almost creepy. And Rami's euphoria in the immediate wake of life-threatening danger is just too much for it not to make him sound like a nutcase. Ramiro, are you okay? Never better. Any landing you walk away from is a good one. Do your worst. We are riders on the storm. Riders on the storm. Fear nothing! But what's truly remarkable is that the dialogue doesn't always manage even to justify its existence. The car side chatter before and after each event rarely communicates anything that wasn't already known or obvious. No additional stakes or motives are established. No anticipation is built. And despite the consistent lack of a point, you can't skip it. I'd take Need for Speed 2015 over Horizon in a heartbeat, because its only sin was not being good, and Horizon is so much worse than that. Its pursuit of the widest appeal has bleached out everything that a player could find appealing. The alienation is as obvious as it was with the progression. The gain is just as invisible. And when I said any level, I really meant it. This goes so much further than character and plot. Look at the ways Horizon's sterility conflicts with the very basis of its subject matter. Street racing is road racing, but with traffic, which makes it dangerous and illegal. The official Horizon checkpoint banners are replaced with red smoke signals, as if to say there's no on-the-record connection. But, um, there's an entire festival location named Horizon Street Scene, to which our protagonist invites the Bournefast street racing crew. Is it illegal, or isn't it? Horizon can't commit to the answer, and the obvious contradiction is embarrassing alone. But Horizon's doomed half-efforts to officiate street racing also comes at the complete sacrifice of its central appeal. The underground, unofficial vibe. There is no street racing without rebellion. There is no speeding without danger. There is no hoonigan without being a hooligan, which is why Playground's attempts to convince us otherwise always fail. Hit the fences! Go through the fields! Don't worry, the farmers love lucha de carreteras. And always draw attention to their insecurity. And it's not the only impossible fight Horizon's religious commitment to positivity has started. Censorship, for instance. The top complaint with Horizon 5's radio just under being a little too short and a little too garbage is that the expletives are censored to the point of absurdity, butchering the rhythm and the tone of the song. Soldier is censored, Swallow is censored, so is Battle, Arse, Hurt, and God. They even removed Bathroom Stall. 
Why? For the sake of a Peggy 3? But it can only amount to further absurdity. Because maybe they can protect our ears from the concept of Dua Lipa's ass, but they're never gonna stop horny weebs from driving their oo-mobiles, or the fact that everything we do in this game is obviously and immensely destructive. You haven't won, Playground, because you can't and no one wants you to. As if for the sake of being thorough, Horizon 5 has also completely sterilized the human aesthetics of the actual festival. Gone are the days when the attendees who enjoy Horizon and the lower staff members who work at Horizon took a central aesthetic role, appearing in abundance on the tracks and amongst other more central characters. Gone are festival locations that bear the slightest resemblance to somewhere human beings may actually have fun or want to spend time. Gone is the impression that there are other important drivers competing at the festival besides you. Gone is the impression that the festival organization is bounded by by literally anything. Gone is the capacity of the festival to immerse and to enliven the larger world, because gone is its interest in maintaining the illusion that it is anything more than the narrative device of a video game. And what's left? What remains of Horizon's soul? The only identifiable aesthetic is the corporate side of the festival that became most prominent in Horizon 3. Now it's all there is. Marketing, an in-game reflection of the forces that brought us here. Horizon's identity is its corporate interests. Perhaps that's why it didn't raise the alarm that the Hot Wheels story is quite literally a five-mission-long ad read for Hot Wheels. Haley speaking with a commercial enthusiasm so intense it actually generates gravity, recounts the history of Hot Wheels under the pretense that everything they did was incredible and awesome and ought to make us just as excited as her. But, why stop there? Loops, jump ramps, bank turns, gravity drops, trestle bridges, chicanes, crossovers, lap counters, multi-lane, side-by-side -side racing launchers. All fully compatible, of course. That's just good engineering. Nowadays, there's even more fun stuff to play with. You've got figure eight, multi-story garages, rubber band kickers, and even giant sharks and dinosaurs that jump on the track. They've even made an auto shop, a working dino, and a teeny tiny oil can and wrench to tune up your cars. I've played with it. If they weren't paid for it, which I highly doubt, they should have been. It's the same thing as entering Nord VPN land in a Watch Dogs DLC. Except here, because marketing is Horizon's identity, we seem to find it natural and acceptable. Perhaps that internal corporatization is also what made the slow introduction of bloated and pointless looter systems from more popular games seem natural and acceptable, and not completely out of place. Loot boxes are central to progression. Moronic emotes and the ridiculous clutter of character creation muddy their reward pool. The Destiny-esque categorization of car rarity meanwhile achieves nothing more than introducing the false and harmful psychological impression that rares are inherently better than commons. You know what people think when they receive a common item in a video game? Junk. Which will only have a counterproductive effect on the willingness, especially of new players, to use or even try all the cars they own. Do you know what Horizon 5 reminds me of? God. They have both abandoned humanity. The stench of chlorine is inescapable. We're playing a game that intentionally resembles an advertisement, which is irritating considered alone, but hits so much harder when you think of what could be, and just how much life, soul, and vibes have meant to racing games of the past. In the long term, players will always choose atmosphere over fidelity. Imagine what the visual wizards at Playground could do if they just put down the bleach. Shit games are made tolerable, and good games are made great by their souls. Horizon 5 is a great game made good by its lack of one. The storms can't be bad, but the ancient peoples of this region knew the value of the rain. Oh! Well, looks like Rami and Home Slice have died. Anyway, Mexico. I don't like it. And no, that's not why they call me White Light. As if this world had any life left to lose, the servers do so crap a job at populating themselves that the streets feel stone dead whenever you're online. Go offline and the AI driver tars will fill in the blanks. Mexico blooms, and suddenly, you believe this is the biggest festival yet. Horizon 5's is a better world when half its features are unavailable. The map design is another problem. It's the largest yet. It's the most detailed. It's objectively the most varied, with rainforest, desert, fields, beaches, a canyon, a city, and a volcano. But it isn't the most varied in practice, because the layout places so much emphasis on the one weakest part of it. The chances you drive through the center of the map on any given journey from A to B are much, much higher than those chances for the sides of the map. It's a mathematical imbalance. It has a large effect on many open world games, and it's vital, because Horizons Mexico seems to have done everything in its power to make it an important problem. The center is bare and dry and massive. It's very dull and very brown, and the volcano helps. But look at the rest of Mexico, the desert off to the side, the rainforest tucked down below and the canyon tucked up above. Even Guanajuato is relatively secluded, and the effect 
effect of this placement on variation is colossal. By the time those endless plains had begun to bore me to tears, there were still chunks of Mexico new to me. But this isn't just a matter of maths. The game does itself no favors by placing the largest festival location where most players gravitate online in that center, or by placing your first house nearby, where you will always spawn every time you play until you buy another one. Assuming you ever do, the problem will still return in miniature. The idea of purchasing permanent spawn points is dreadful. It guarantees boredom of the closest environment, whilst other parts go forgotten. Mexico makes tragically poor use of itself, and it doesn't have the intensity of Four Seasons to help alleviate its blandness. It's not a bad map, but it is my least favorite so far. So, do you still believe I like Forza Horizon 5? Because I do. I really do. It's so vivid, and the cars are so fun, and there's so many. It's a damn good game. But it's been five games now, and ten years, and I'm still longing for the day Forza Horizon meets its potential. Playground are too timid to rework what's weak, and too eager to broaden their audience based on the insights of a spreadsheet. In another ten years, people will still return to Horizon 2. They'll still return to the other great races longing for their world and thrills. And Forza Horizon 5 will still be good, but it will not be remembered. Now, when it comes to remembering people, on the other hand, how better to immortalize yourself in cyberspace than a website? A sole and simple hub for your entire online presence. Do you have things to sell? Sell them seamlessly with Squarespace's integrated stores. Do you have things to do? Tell everyone about it with integrated blogging and scheduled posts. Or be secretive with the member-exclusive chat rooms. Do you like looking pretty? Guess what? They have the entire RGB palette, alongside comprehensive but surprisingly advanced customization tools. And if you don't believe me, you can find out firsthand free. You'll only need payment info when you're ready to publish, at which point get 10% off your first purchase of a site or domain with offer code WHITELIGHT. Special thanks go to Brybase, Chase Baker, Chino, Dr. Pavel, Eli Weaver, FatGuy688, G Series, I Hear You, John C, John Lemley, Caleb Doss, Lex Williams, L. Hudson, MT the Poet, Newts, Storyteller Max, Save, The Wayfinder 12, William Bossler, Warthol, Andre Baltuta, Anton Attila, Bloth, Bosian, Brandon Harris, Caleb Finnamore, Calvin Black, Colby the Ranch Man, Connor Fraser, Corey Walterbeek, Dan Walker, Deluxo, DJ, Dominic Jaworski, Dylan Schaefer Murphy, Eric Mahal, Ethan Seach, Floyd Dibbon, George Garagian, Hannes Norriger, Hidibari, Holy Shift. I joined Tier 3 because I wanted to hear White Light say this out loud. I also joined Tier 3 just so White Light would say my name. I pay my cam girl, so why not you? Jacob Bartels, Jason H, Joe Simmons, Joshua W. Schreiner, Casper Schmidt, Kieran Drees, Malone Patron, Milo W, Monochrome Only, Nathan, Navy Husky, Princess Z. Rackin Hawk, Rollo Runner, Shade, Shah Zabe, Arshad Mirza, The Maid Casca, The Last Great Opium Den, Trending Tech, V, Vertiguous, and Voy.